Hi, my name is Kyla Rowland, she, her, hers, and I'm a 2019 Watson Fellow from Davidson College. During my Watson year, I studied how social and cultural factors influence the number of girls studying STEM and women eventually entering the STEM workforce in Trinidad, Norway, and South Africa. For my seven to eight months of experiences, learning and growing with such different communities, I've learned three important things. Reforms that throw money at broken educational systems can't be effective if they don't also meet the most basic needs of the community. In South Africa, I saw how the very recent history of apartheid has created racial and class-based learning disparities that overshadow gender differences. Despite increases in educational spending and enrollment nationally, the drastic difference in resources and quality of learning provided to the haves and the have-nots has contributed to an educational system that makes it hard for students to receive a quality STEM education. Two, a welcoming, supportive, and enjoyable learning environment is the key to engaging more students, but specifically girls and women in STEM. I learned this lesson in Trinidad and Tobago, where students also shared that learning through a variety of styles, like interactive demonstrations and a mixture of lecture and conversational learning, make it easier to learn information, retain it, and enjoy learning it. And three, unspoken social barriers can serve as a powerful deterrent to women entering STEM, even when the women are given the educational and economic freedom to do so. In order for women to hold more and higher leadership roles in STEM professions, the social stigmas of being a woman in STEM have to be squashed entirely. Welcome to your Digital Mentor Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Christine Boynet from the Welcome Sanger Institute. In this week's episode, we'll be discussing women leadership in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, known as its more familiar acronym, STEM. So we have a problem of retention of women in research. In fact, we only make up less than 25% of the leadership roles, despite being 75% of the workforce. It's clear there's a leaky pipeline in academic research. But could it solely be down to personal choice or circumstances beyond our control to leave for different pastures? Or is the infrastructure still built in a way that limits the ability of women to take up more leadership positions? For example, we've heard of research that shows fewer women getting grants, or as primary caregivers, the hours simply may not work. And to discuss these themes, we have two wonderful guests who have been fairly outspoken about empowering women to be fearless and lead. Our first guest is Professor Shubha Tolle, who holds a PhD in biology and is a principal investigator at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Mumbai, India, and is also the Dean of Graduate Studies. And we also have Professor Dorothy Mboringacha, who is a medical doctor by training and is the senior specialist on HIV for UNICEF's global programs. She also holds a post as a professor of pediatrics at the University of Nairobi in Kenya. So at this point, we typically ask our guests to introduce themselves and tell us a bit more about their work. But this week, I wanted to change it up a little. I'm going to ask our guests to tell us a bit more about their journey to leadership, because I feel a lot of these things we'll discuss today, you'll have learned along the way. So putting into context will be really useful for our listeners. So I'll start with you, Shubha. Can you tell us a bit more of your journey um, to where you're at now? Thank you. That's a question that I'm not sure the answer is going to be what you wanted to hear in terms of leadership, because I think you sort of do what you really want to and what you can and where your heart leads you. And if it all works out, people invite you to speak about leadership. I mean, you know, leadership is not a conscious thing that you decide you're going to do. You just sort of evolve into one. And then you look back and say, hmm, okay, you know, maybe that choice I made there or that choice, you know, that's what led me here. I don't know if any point I consciously even thought about leadership. And I guess, you know, a reasonably successful senior scientist is described as a leader, but you don't actively sort of do anything to become one or even know that you are one. It seems polarizing, but it's actually real. I think in doing research for this topic, I was trying to think of the end race for women in research, but I don't think there's an end point. It's just you are a professor and then you have to keep going. I would change the question around and saying, you know, what was your, your journey to become the position in academic research you are today and kind of what inspired you along the way? I guess I was always fascinated by science and I dreamed of being a scientist. Actually, physics was my first passion because it seemed to incorporate all of the beauty of science and math all into one. This was in school. And then when I discovered biology, you know, its complexity just drew me in. When I discovered 
you know, the brain and how it grows and, and uh, how genes regulate it, I was completely sold. I would say my inspiration came from watching my mom, my mother's sort of deal with the challenges and hardships life threw at her. My mother was the sixth of seven sisters and one brother, and her, she lost her parents young, and she and her youngest sister took turns, one studied and one worked to support each other. And she became an occupational therapist, which is a, a job that does not get a lot of respect in India. Only the doctors get respect. She badly wanted to be a surgeon, but she could not afford to get into medical school. And she said, you know, I'm going to do absolutely the best I can do with my profession and redefine it. And she, in some sense, showed me that one shouldn't limit what one does in life to one's job description. That's amazing. To students, I say, you know, your syllabus doesn't define the upper limit of what you should learn. Your syllabus is the lower limit. So my mom is somebody who just showed me by her example that uh, the struggle is what brings meaning and fulfillment. It's having everything perfect is in fact not as rewarding as having to struggle and overcome something and creatively come up with a solution. Be it generating props for a dance or play that you've, you know, directed for your children. Be it orthotic device for a child who is leaning one way because they've had surgery on one part of their body. Uh, my mother worked at a cancer hospital and she, she could make anything. She designed what I believe is India's sort of first low-cost breast prosthesis. She took a sheet of sponge and filled it with tiny, tiny beads. So beads flow like sand, so they give it the weight and the shape. And she would simply look at the intact breast and design the other one. And then home stitch using a, a material of different shades of brown cover and an elastic strap so the woman could wear the breast like she would wear a bra. I grew up with this. And this was washable, you know, Indian uh, rural women, uh, you know, being able to work in the fields and so on with this. She designed entire limbs, a leg with a knee joint, which when the person needed to squat for their work, they could unhook something and uh, the, the knee would collapse. She, she could make anything. There was just no challenge that she couldn't meet. And what was amazing is she never sought glory and credit and, you know, to patent anything. She just designed unique processes for the individual before her, no matter who they were. This was, I mean, mesmerizing. Inspiring is just too small a word. This just showed me the possibilities are endless. It sort of showed me that I should follow my heart and follow my path and that working towards something is the reward. So that sort of guided my life. I wanted to study neuroscience because the brain was the most fascinating sort of organ system I could think of. And a PhD in India, at the time, neuroscience was not uh, available to do, to do research in. So I actually went to the United States. I got my PhD at Caltech, did my postdoc at the University of Chicago. I always wanted to return to contribute to the culture that uh, educated me and that supported me and gave me a platform so that I could uh, train at the best places in the world. So I returned and took a job at the Tata Institute, which is a, the sort of premier in research institute of, uh, in India. I run my lab since 1999, 21 years now. And I'm delighted to say I've uh, you know been able to train young women and men who wanted to do their research uh, degrees in neuroscience, masters and PhD and postdocs. I've had some stellar lab people. So it's all worked out. It's all sort of worked out. And that's my story. Wow, that's really fascinating. And thank you so much for sharing the story of your mom. And she sounds really like an awesome and inspirational person. As you say, inspiration is, an, is too small a word. And I think like most women, I would say also my mom is also an inspiration. So I think that's a really nice way of linking heroes in different forms also. It's, it's so nice to hear a story such as that of your mom. And I was wondering, Dorothy, could you also give us, I'm sure also a very fascinating story of how you know, you've come to have such such a leadership position in your current role, but also just your story. We'd love to hear more about your story. I've just been reflecting as we've been having this conversation, trying to see where did it all start? And it's really not always apparent where it all started from. I always think my story began with my grandmother, which is always sort of like one generation back. And um, at the time, education for girls wasn't a thing. And my maternal grandfather was really against education. I mean, he was of the school that women shouldn't really be educated. 
they're going to get married, they're going to go to another family and they're not worth investing in. But my grandmother was, she caught the vision early and was determined that her two girls would go to school. I always think that that's where my story started because because she valued education, my mom and her older sister both got to go to school. And, you know, my mom wasn't in science, but, you know, she, she went to school. She ended up being a secretary, had a job, and was really passionate about making sure that my sister and I got to do whatever we wanted in terms of education. Because she had that chance. She kept saying, you know, it doesn't matter what you choose, whatever path you choose, be good at it. So how did I get excited about science? I'm, I'm remembering names of my teachers as we speak. I remember Mrs. Karanja, she was my biology teacher. And I see myself in that biology class dissecting a frog. I remember when we had to first dissect frogs and I was sort of like, no, not going to do this. But then yeah. dissecting the frog and then seeing the heart and how everything just works. It just, it hooked me. I'm sort of like, I'm going to learn about the human body in whatever form. And, you know, so I was inspired by teachers along the way. Fortunately for me, my uncle was a medical doctor. So my uncle had gone to medical school and came back and would talk about, he's a young uncle, so sort of like an older brother, would come back and talk about how exciting it was to be in medical school in uh, Uganda, in Makerere. And I sort of said, okay, I also want to go to that place. I want to go to Makerere and become a doctor, of course. By the time I got to medical school, uh, University of Nairobi had their own medical school and uh, I, I joined medical school in Nairobi. So that's my path. But how did I end up in HIV is, is also the other question. As you go through your career, things happen that trigger responses in you. As I did my internship, I was sort of struck by how many sick children were there with really preventable conditions. And as I also went on to do a house job in, at the coast in Kenya, it sort of was like, no, it's great to be treating all these kids, but we should be working at preventing what we can prevent. And so my, my leaning towards public health started at that point. I went back and did my residency in pediatrics and child health, and then subsequently went on to do a public health uh, degree, which was heavy in epidemiology and biostats, and showed me the link between science, the hardcore science research programs that deliver services and policy. So that axis. For a long time, I was in the Department of Pediatrics, teaching pediatrics in child health, motivating people to see that prevention is better than cure. But if we have to have sick children, then we need to give them the best quality care. My research was mostly in uh, infectious diseases, initially TB, malaria research, and then HIV came along. HIV hit our continent and, you know, we started seeing lots of kids dying and mothers looking so helpless. And somehow this became my life's work because one, it was highly stigmatizing. People couldn't even say the word AIDS or HIV. The mothers holding these babies who are dying of AIDS were so vulnerable. I would say they are so vulnerable. We started work in our department, uh, myself and a, a good colleague of mine, Professor Ndwati, started doing work to understand how mother-to-child transmission of HIV happens. Much wasn't known about it then. It was right at the beginning of the pandemic. So our department was collaborating with uh, universities in, in the U.S., specifically University of Washington. And, you know, so the power of collaborations to try and solve problems. We had the patients, we had the passionate researchers to do the epi end of it, to do the clinical end of it. Uh, we didn't have lab infrastructure to sort of uh, understand the virus, but we, we were keen to understand the virus. And so from my, my group, my research group, we started sending off our young researchers, our lab biostatisticians to the University of Washington to be able to grow those skills. And then they would send their fellows to come and learn about what HIV is and sort of get a handle on um, the life impact to get inspiration around why it was such an important issue of our day. You know, so that's sort of where, where my journey started. And as I always do a double take when people say, oh, you know, when did you become this great leader? I'm sort of like, okay, thank you. <laughs> but um, it sort of grows, you grow in the job as our research team grew, then you, you have a team that you're mentoring along the way. 
I had mentors along the way too. My initial mentors, because there were so few women doing academic research in the medical school, were actually male professors. I had uh, two wonderful male professors, uh, Professor Wafula and uh, Onyango, who really held my hands and kept saying, you know, we need to be telling our own stories and researching our own problems. We need to have our names attached to our science. Because at that point, there was a lot of science happening in Africa, but really most of it not by Africans. And so they inspired me in that way. They helped me to be a tough negotiator because when you're doing collaborative research, you have to always negotiate space. They come back every time I had to discuss with the collaborators, even the funding allocations and things like that. I'd go to my mentors and, you know, they were always sort of like, no, we are, we're not going to be a junior partner in this collaboration. So you need to negotiate the space. So that was something that, um, that I learned from those mentors. And then also just to collaborate, to negotiate space, to give and take, <laughs> because you see, everybody has to get something. So getting to that situation where everybody felt they were, the collaboration was serving them well. So I saw myself not very much as a leader, maybe sometimes as a matchmaker, a broker to make it, making this thing happen. So I did that for a while. It was really exciting to be at the medical school. But then at a point in time, a good friend of mine said, you know what, we need you to move from doing this research on mother-child transmission and pediatric HIV. We need voices in the policy space. And, um, you know, I see a job the way you'd be a perfect fit. And I said, no, I'm fine. I'm doing good. And then I run it by my husband. And he says, you know what, you become too comfortable. You're a big fish in a small pond. You know, you walk along the corridors and everybody's, oh, hi, professor, and all that. And you're really comfortable. And he says, you need to get out of your comfort zone. So thanks to my husband, I applied to this job. And, you know, in my heart, I'm sort of saying, I hope they don't take me. But uh, <laughs> as fate would have it, they take me. And, um, you know, the rest is history. So I joined the, the UNICEF team and uh, got into the policy space and really now work more with giving guidance to government programs technical uh, support and advocating, advocating for the needs of children. I happen to do it right now in, in the area of HIV, but care about health issues that impact children and many other issues that impact children. So that's my journey to where I am now. That's amazing. And I think to both of you, you're so well learned um, in both your careers that it's a testament to why educating women is important because it not only advances Womankind, but in fact, advancing the whole community. Because I think what I'm getting themes from both of you is that you took people along with you. It's not just you who got educated, but you've educated and lent mentorship, I'm sure, to women along the way. I think one thing that's super important I've learned also from my mentors, this thing of taking risks, Dorothy, that you mentioned. And there's an article I read a while ago and it said, you know, men are the ones who just take risks. In fact, for example, the, if we're looking at a job description, women will see everything until they fulfill absolutely every single point, they'll feel to apply for the job. But men see maybe two out of three and they're like, yeah, I can do two of them. I think I can do or two out of five and they'll do it. So I wanted both of you to maybe comment on that. And I'll start with Shuba first and hopefully Dorothy, you can add to that. You're both nodding furiously. So, you know, I'd love to get your sentiment on taking risks and how women can really just start taking the same risks and, and knowing that they're, they're capable of doing the job. Um, so Shubha, do you mind kicking us off with this discussion? I agree completely. I'll give an example. I chair the Women in Science panel of the Indian Academy of Sciences. We have a really nice committee. And one of the things we decided to do as a committee is to make sure there are enough qualified mm -hmm. women nominees for various forms of recognition, you know, awards, fellowships to academies. And we came across a pretty prestigious award, which had a nice amount of prize money attached to it. And the brochure described the past awardees. And of course, there were very few women. I mean, even in disciplines like biology and chemistry, where there are women represented. So I actually wrote to the committee saying, how come? And of course, we got the usual hand wringing that, you know, but there just weren't enough nominees. So we said, OK, maybe our women in science panel can do something about it. So we met uh, over Zoom. We listed women candidates that we knew of who had done really well in various disciplines. And we decided that we would basically actively try and promote their nominations. 
So I wrote to them all saying, hey, you know, we would like to help get you nominated for this award. And almost uniformly, I got shocked surprise. Oh, I mean, really me? Oh, you know, really me? For uh, So this is not something that you would see with male candidates, right? When, when it comes time to be nominated to, say, fellowships of academies, most of the women I have spoken to say, oh, do you have to ask somebody to nominate you? I thought some, you know, magical powers that be just sort of dream up people's names and nominate them. Oh, and I had to tell them, you know, the world doesn't work that way. People are out there sort of, uh, you know, soliciting, promoting themselves within reason. But, uh, you know, you so these are sort of things that men seem to, on average, know to go out and try and get. And women sort of wait to be recognized. This is something I just see across the board. And I'll go one step further, right? I was fortunate in that when I joined the Tata Institute, my department chair sought to nominate me for, you know, the sort of junior level of some form of recognition. Then a senior faculty member left another set of nomination papers on my table and said, hey, you know, let's. I was fortunate that people encouraged me. But uh, not long ago, a woman friend who's known me for a long time gave me an acerbic, almost dressing down on how she perceived I've been hustling for recognition my whole career. And I'm like, you know, I happen to have the same recognitions my husband, who is a physicist, has and her husband, who's also a scientist, has. She said, yeah, but, you know, the way you celebrate it afterwards. And I'm like, do you not know anybody who gets some recognition in our institute, invites everybody to tea? Everybody does this. I mean, this is a, you know, wh why is it wrong when I do it? And, you know, how did you think all of these men who got these awards uh, uh, got these awards? Do you not think they actually filed in nomination papers? Do you not think they actually, you know, prepared some documents? Do you think magically the men just, uh, you know, but so women who get recognized must have got it by some cutthroat, sort of uh, unpleasantly aggressive, uh, undeserved means because they're just, you know, like that. Because, you know, good women are more, uh, you know, decent and circumspect about things. Nobody ever uses these parameters for men. Yes. They don't ask them to be meek and humble. So, I mean, this is the shocker, right? That women criticize harshly women who are successful and presume, presume, the word used was hustling for awards. Oh, my God. You know, I mean... Yeah, so that's 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 a vignette. Oh gosh, that's a really intense story. But I think it really reflects one. And I like how within telling us the story, you're also like, you should just go for it and do whatever you want. And also not, even though we rejoicing is sort of being told you embodying these are male characteristics or male women, we're, we're all homo sapiens. So I think rejoicing should not be limited to a version of women celebrating the smile and be humble. You know, if I may just connect to an earlier theme about mentorship, I've come to realize that, you know, this is for the young students out there. It's wonderful if you get good mentors, you know, handed to you on a platter. But I've realized that it's not our right. We don't have the right to almost anything. We don't have a right to good anything. You know, we have the, we, we have the right to be grateful and appreciative when, you know, good mentors come our way. But we do have the responsibility to go out and find them when we can. Mentorship can come from anywhere. Both my PhD and postdoc uh, supervisors had a mentorship style, which was essentially pretty disengaged. You had to go find them for you know, information advice. They, were, they weren't really into shaping somebody's career. I felt the lacuna and I realized I had to learn what I needed to learn. I just felt these gaps in my life. So I have very, very valued peer mentors. Okay, there was a postdoc who joined the lab. I'd love to name her Karen Allendorfer, who was my peer mentor, partner. You know, she was just a couple of years ahead of me. And we saw each other and supported each other through many things. I have found inspiration in people younger than me. You don't have to find some old gray-haired Nobel laureate to be inspired by. I'm inspired by a gutsy seven-year-old who, upon being sort of perceived that she was being forced to do something that some older person wanted her to do, came up with, I was not put upon this earth to follow your wishes. Okay. <laughs> I love that. This, this is my niece. She's now in her, uh, you know, 30s. 
But at the age of seven, she came up with this. I was not put upon this earth to follow your wishes. I was so struck by it that when I give talks to children, to schoolgirls, I show a picture of her in her school uniform at the age seven. And I translate this into as many languages that I can speak. And I make everybody say this. You know, let's just say this aloud. I was not put upon the earth to follow your wishes. The sky is much, much more beyond this. So nobody will help you. You know, nobody will help you. They don't have to. But you do have to help yourself. And when you ask for help and when you find the right people, there are good people out there who just, you know, may not have crossed your path. And you can get the mentorship you need from multiple sources, from many directions. I've written this story in a Nature Cell Biology article. It's called Mentorship Comes From Many Sources. So if you Google my name and this title, you will get the rest of the story. But so, okay, if that helps, that's what it is. I love it. I'm gonna. We're gonna link that story in the description box. And but I think you've touched on, and I think this is what Dorothy had mentioned earlier. First of all, seeking mentorship that's not necessarily with people that look like you, but also anyone who you come across. And I'm a champion for mentors who I'm friends with, and uh, actually two of my mentors are, are, are male. But Dorothy and you highlighted some of your wonderful mentors who were male and have given you some of the best advice you've had. But I'd like to also get your kind of take and maybe examples of how you took risks or heard of taking risks so that we can be in the same running for jobs and, and not feel that we can't access or limit ourselves just by our own talking ourselves out of it. Um, was there any kind of experience you can tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, you know, when you asked the question, it was, I was just nodding so hard because in the job I'm in currently, I also, you know, I look at people applying for stuff, for positions, for, for grants, for what have you. And <laughs> I always smile because the applications where you sort of like, well, this guy doesn't even have a PhD and he's applying for, it's always a guy, always. It's yeah. never a woman. You know, so we self-censor a lot. We want to dot all the I's and cross all the T's before we put ourselves out to the world. And so encouraging people to put themselves out there. I know for me, when we're writing grants, you know, you, you'd be talking to uh, somebody you're mentoring and you're saying, okay, I think you're right to go for an entry level grant. And they would look shocked. And me, I mean, how, I mean, you know, so as women, we self-censor a lot. And I think it's in the socialization. As a woman, you need to be... A, B, C, D, fill, fill the blanks. It makes us sit, sit back rather than push ourselves forward and try and participate. This past week, I lost one of a, an influential person I consider as a mentor. Kathy Wilford uh, was a pioneer in pediatric AIDS and she died this past uh, week. And, you know, she was the one who would always say, you know, speak up. I remember we'd go to meetings and um, as African scientists, we'd go to these large meetings and, you know, you'd have colleagues from the North, you know, who'd just come up and they'd be saying whatever they're saying, some of it good, some of it not particularly <laughs> compelling, but they had no hesitations putting their ideas out there. And you would just be sitting back and sort of saying, mm, I wonder whether this is a good idea. Mm, I wonder whether I should say that. And we keep self-censoring. And she, Kathy would tell us, listen, she would actually, <laughs> I remember one time she really put me on the spot and said, look, Dorothy, what do you have to say about this? You're doing a lot of work in this area. What do you have to say about this? And that model I have used many times to pull young women in because of the way we're socialized, we sort of tend to sit back. So I deliberately tried to pull young women in. Sometimes uh, they don't take it nicely. They feel you're, they're being put on the spot. You know, it's painful at the, in the moment when you're feeling all embarrassed, but later on you realize, oh, I'm glad I was able to speak or whatever. Going into the unknown comes with the territory. I mean, if you're going to do any science, I mean, Shuba does basic science. I do more public health and medical sciences. If you don't take that risk, if you don't ask those questions, if you don't, you, you can't grow. The very first NIH grant that we applied for was like, you know, everyone said, you're not going to get it. You're not American. You're not an American institution, what have you, what have you. We said, it's okay. And we worked really hard. And of course, I mean, initially we didn't get it, but we got scored and we were told to revise and resubmit. And it felt good because I said, okay, they see us. We put ourselves out there and they see value in our work. So unless you put yourself out there, people don't get a chance to see your excellence. I think that that's sort of encouraging women to be able to not be afraid of their excellence. 
you know, not to make yourself small because the way we're socialized is just shrink yourself a little bit. And even in the, in the personal arena, you know, if you're too strong, you're, nobody's ever going to date you or marry you or whatever, all that social stuff that weighs on women. And so I think um, we as older women need to really pull the young women in and, and, uh, and so forth. Talking of mentors as, as well, I, my male mentors, I love them and what have you. But then I also had these young mentors. So I'm so glad, Shuba, you talked about this because we were collaborating with the University of Washington. They had been doing research for ages. They had all the resources. They had the lab infrastructure and what have you. And I made really good friends. And, you know, many of them much younger than me. But I would say, you know, you're my mentor. And they would laugh because here I am, older than them, in some ways more accomplished than them in the academic path. But I was looking to them for mentorship in particular areas of research. So again, I actually really concur with mentorship comes from all directions and you have to go out there and look for it. So men, men also need to be educated. I remember um, many times we sort of want to work on ourselves and, and so forth. But you know, sometimes when you call men on it, every now and then you get a pleasant surprise when the men say, oh, I didn't realize you, you call them out on the fact that the vibes that they're giving out is, is, is intimidating or excluding women or they're, they're, they're not letting the women's voices be heard. And you call them out, of, out on it. Many men actually say, okay, I didn't realize. I need to do better. Of course, some will look at you like, oh, you know, you, you have to learn how to play with the big dogs. But there, there are some who really are allies. So men as allies as well, because many times we see men as sort of it's us and that versus them. But there are many who are also allies and would like to see diversity in the space. And so pulling on those allies who then bring along other men is, is something that... So I'll leave it there. So much to say. I mean, we could... I mean, I think... <laughs> the time. We need to make this a series, I think. Yeah, I think so. But I'm so excited that you guys are doing this and giving us the space to talk about this stuff. Thanks, Christine. It's wonderful to hear this coming from you and from a different country and a culture than I grew up in. I mean, the, the resonance is so there. And when Dorothy was saying something about uh, making yourself feel small, I saw um, Shuba nodding furiously again. I wondered if you can just jump in with a comment. There's something I can tell from your aura. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so this seems to be a universal phenomenon about women being encouraged to make themselves small and that being portrayed as a good thing. In my culture, whether or not you find your own partner, increasingly young people find their own partners. Sometimes the parents uh, help you along. They, you know, advertise in matrimonial columns and then line up a list of prospectives and, you know, help you make the choice. This is the modern day equivalent of the arranged marriage. So it's not like they force you to do it, but at a certain age, parents begin to get anxious. This age is much, much younger for women than for men. This age is typically by the time a woman finishes her bachelor's degree, if at all. Okay, I have friends who are teachers in colleges who say that, you know, sometimes girls are encouraged to leave their education before they finish their bachelor's degree because a good match has been found. Because, you know, if a woman is not married, then she's incomplete her whole life. And, you know, uh, and then, my God, if you uh, sign up to do a PhD, then who will marry you? This who will marry you is imbued into a young girl's head. And this does a lot of damage. So, you know, we talk about leaky pipeline. We're working at the wrong end of the pipeline. We need to work from, you know, when a girl is eight, nine, 10 years old, because that's when this whole marry you business comes in. I'm going to get to the, the making yourself small bit, but I just remember a quote from an inspiring woman scientist, Poonam Chandra, uh, again, younger than me. She was a PhD student in TIFR when I was a new faculty. Uh, she did a brilliant piece of work in astrophysics got one of the most prestigious fellowships to uh, go to the U.S. to do a postdoc. And now she is back at TIFR's National Center for Radio Astronomy as a faculty member and, you know, doing ex exceptionally well. She says where she grew up in a very small Indian town, when you seek blessings from your seniors in the family, you know, you, you bow down, you seek their blessings, young boys and girls do it. The boys get a different blessing than the girls. What she got was always, oh, what a sweet child. You'll make everybody happy in your uh, uh, in-laws house. You know, when you, when you get married, you'll make everybody happy. 
she said it took her many years to come to the realization that her job in life was not to always make others happy. Who's going to make me happy? So this is something she says when she addresses young women that everybody will watch out for their happiness. It is not your job to make others happy. And this is something girls have to realize. So thank you, Poonam, for giving me that. But this resonates with women all over the world, all over the world. I gave a talk about this and I got emails from, oh, I don't know, Brazil and Germany and <laughs> Australia. In a marriage, a girl is always supposed to be the lesser, okay? When parents are lining up candidates for their boy or their girl, the boy has to be a little taller than the girl, two inches taller is all right, two inches shorter, no, no, no. So that literally, literally and figuratively, she's always looking up to him. A boy has to be more qualified. He can have a PhD and she can have a master's, but oh my God, never the reverse. Why? Because, you know, his ego will be bruised and her job in life is to make him feel important. All of this is subtext, right? But they set it up so that she's less qualified, younger. So the combination of younger and less qualified is deadly because it naturally means that she will have the lesser paying job, the more insecure job, perhaps less stable one. So when time comes to decide which city to move to or, you know, major career or who will give up the job to whatever, take care of the baby, it's always going to be the one who's earning less money. But the whole thing was set up like that. So she's set up to be the lesser. Broadly, I think because she'll always be the one to compromise. When there is a conflict, she will be the one to give in because she's already been defined as lesser, inferior. You know, her job in life is to make the guy feel. So, you know, I'm, I'm stating this in a very stark or way, but the subtext is there. The subtext is so there. And young girls will not know to break it because by the time they reach the age of making decisions, the damage is already done. It's so deeply programmed that you know, who will marry you if, you know, you're outspoken, if you do this, if you do this, who will marry you is, is, is the threat. And then when you marry somebody, they have to always be more than you so that you'll always, uh, we do this to our girls. And this is not just my country. In different ways, this sort of seems to resonate all over the world. I would, I would love to hear, Dorothy, does some of this match? Completely. I mean, it's like you're talking about... <laughs> You talk about Kenya, you talk about my village, <laughs> you talk about my family. <laughs> no, it matches. It really does. You know, just to tie into some of the themes, Christine, you were trying to touch on in this, uh, our conversation. So now add COVID into the mix. My scenario, people are working from home. He works from home, hubby, husband, man of your life. You're working from home. There are kids in the house and this scenario that Shuba has so eloquently painted where you are the lesser or your, your career is the lesser. How do you negotiate the space? This is what women have been struggling with. You know, many of the women I'm, I'm on social media with or whatever have been sort of like, how do you negotiate this? And, you know, the interesting thing is if already you are very disempowered in that relationship, then women are experiencing a lot of burnout because yes, you have to run the home, you have to do the homeschooling because your kids will mommy, mommy, you know, so you will have to do the homeschool. And your boss also wants the output. And so it's been a really stressful period for women. The other day on my walk, I do a, a sort of, I call it my COVID walk when I get out and, and uh, I'm able to sort of get some fresh air. You know, I met a guy and he was with kids and he was, you know, there was a toddler and you know, so I just, we had a conversation and he says, you know, it's my wife's turn to work. So I'm out here with the kids. And I said, wow, that's great. He says, yeah, when this all happened, it, things were falling apart and we sat down and she just sort of said, no, I have to have my turn and she has to have her turn with the kids. And I'm really enjoying it because I'm getting to know my kids, blah, blah, blah. So obviously he's, he was a very hands-on dad and enjoying it. But you know, you have to, you have to demand the space within your homes. Otherwise, you're not going, women are just going to fall apart. And there's, as we know from the data coming in and from the reports coming in from the field, in my field, there's a lot more abuse of women. So gender-based violence is on the increase. Child abuse is on the increase because people are in these uh, pressure cooker situations where the, the woman is feeling stressed, overworked. The man is feeling he has to do some work or maybe doesn't have work. And so it's a horrible uh, situation and a, a pressure cooker situation. And just learning how to negotiate under crisis like that is another thing that women have to learn how to do. 
But our tendency, again, as women, is to try and be superwomen. You know, so I'll just get up early. I'll just get up at 4 a.m. and I'll just do this and I'll just do the, make sure that this is in order and I'll have cooked for the whole week. And I, we set ourselves up sometimes. We just want to be superwoman. And many men also, when you say, you know what? You're going to have to do A, B, C, D, E. They get taken aback initially, but once you do let go of being superwoman, you can get into a more perfect partnership. And so I think that's the other advice I would give to my younger self is stop trying to be superwoman. She doesn't exist. She's a, she's a figment of somebody's imagination. Build a partnership that works. And so it, then the partnerships that have worked outside COVID continue to work within COVID because you can always negotiate how to support each other. But partnerships that don't work before COVID are not working now and are toxic. That's just my perspective on the whole COVID scenario. And even with your bosses, if your bosses were people who were able to hear from you, understand that you have needs outside, outside the mission, the work, and are able to help you adapt, then you're more productive. You know, so if your workplace is supportive within this COVID era, then you continue to be productive. But if your workplace isn't adaptable and supportive, and recognizing, giving you flexibility around working hours, et cetera, then again, there's a, there's a challenge. So there's a lot of adjustments to be made by everybody. I like those points. And I think you echo that boundaries exist both in your personal life. You have to acknowledge when you need help, but I think equally in terms of the workplace, establishing boundaries with your work workmates. So you're like, you know, I'm not reachable within certain times can also help you with this burnout um, that maybe some people are experiencing. Uh, Shuba, I wondered if you have anything to add to, to this point, this super important point of how p women uh, can cope uh, in this current pandemic and maybe advice or experience you've experienced in your lab. Well, I'll do my best to add to what Dorothy beautifully put. You know, we can't change the world. We don't have that power. We can only change ourselves. Life is really about playing the hand you're dealt with, right? So circumstances exist. We are each the product of our past. The very culture that has programmed us in many directions has also given us uh, a richness. I mean, we are a summary of everything that we have experienced, right? Accepting that this is the past and now this is where I am today. How do I want to go in the future? That step, I think women maybe don't take the time to consider that this is something in my hands today. Yes, my children depend on me. Yes, they'll call out to mommy, not daddy for, you know, uh, a million things. Yes, all manner of employees or people will more easily disturb a woman than a man. A woman sitting at a table can be called out to and interrupted, but a man sitting at a, you know, a computer table is, uh, oh my God, he's working. So these exist, right? What we do about them is in our hands. If a situation like the COVID pandemic does not give us the impetus to say, okay, I'm going to do a restock. Let's have a family conference. Okay, this issue is important to me. When I am 60, 70 years old, I will look back and I will wish that I had asked all of you guys, my family, my dear ones to help. This is what I've been struggling with. This is what you've been you know, getting the benefits of. Here is how you can help me. Some version of this conversation, if you don't have the courage to have it with your family, have it with yourself. Look into the mirror and ask the woman in the mirror what she deserves. Just have the conversation with yourself out loud. You know, I am worth this. This is what I'm struggling with. How can you help me? Ask the woman in the mirror. And maybe from there will come the confidence to spread this net a little wide. You know, so I'm extremely, extremely fortunate in the family I have. I have two boys. They see me as an extremely strong woman. I have my temper tantrums and my meltdowns just as easily as my husband does. Uh, we're both scientists. Uh, we both have the same jobs. And my children have grown up seeing me in this very, very equal role, right? And yes, in the pandemic, the housework got to be a little more than, you know, a little impossible. So my solution was to kind of let it go. So we lived in a messy house for a little while and <laughs> because I had, I had work to do, I had, you know, Dean of Graduate Studies stuff and this and that. It so happens I'm the chief cook because I really enjoy cooking. So I'm doing that gender stereotype role, but I love doing it. 
This means that my morning goes in preparing, you know, the food for the day. Well, my older son has taken up scrubbing the bathrooms and he does it with pride and joy. I love it. Younger son, kind of little kicking and screaming, but he's taken up the sweeping and mopping of the house on a schedule. They hate to fold clothes. So I've kind of addressed the problem by gathering them in a big unfolded messy bunch and dumping it on their beds and saying, deal with it. (laughs) So they sleep in the mess for a while. And then eventually, you know, I realize that the house doesn't have to be all tippy toppy, right? And people then step up when you kind of say, look, you know, there's only one of me. And, you know, it's okay. Have a meltdown every so often. They'll realize you're human. But first have that conversation with the woman in the mirror. I love that. And I think that's such good points, both of your rates. And I really hate to do this. Uh, Sadly, we're running out of time. But as you said, I think this needs a conversation should be done in a series. Um, And that's also given me ideas to kind of make this an ongoing series. And I would really, really love to keep going. But unfortunately, I think in terms of time and also to give you guys back your lives, in the interest of time, I will say we should just cut it short slightly. But first, we're going to hear, uh, take a quick break and hear from our sponsors. But when we come back, we'd love to hear your take-home messages for our listeners. Um, we'll be back. This episode is supported by Advanced Courses and Scientific Conferences, a program which develops and delivers training and conferences that span basic research, cutting-edge biomedicine, and application of genomics in healthcare. Through engaging and networking, the events educate, inspire, and transform careers worldwide. This episode is also supported by the Wellcome Sangha Institute. It undertakes large-scale research that forms the foundations of knowledge in biology and medicine. It uses the power of genome sequencing to understand and harness the information in DNA. The Sangha's discoveries are used to improve health and to understand life on Earth. This episode is also supported by Social Entrepreneurship to Spur Health. The SESH group uses crowdsourcing to enhance health and health research with a focus on low- and middle-income countries. Welcome back. So we always ask our guests to summarize one or two points for our listeners to take away from the discussion. And to Shuba and Dorothy, again, thank you so much for coming on board and and being so open and sharing such good points for our listeners and women in STEM. But I'd ask you, this is a little bit different from what we normally do, is what advice would you give to your young self in getting where you are now or just general advice about uh, not being afraid and, and embracing every aspect of your career if it ends up in leadership. Um, and I will kick off with Dorothy. I was kind of hoping you'd kick off with Shuba. But you know, what I would tell my younger self is that this is all leading somewhere. Because sometimes when you're in the trenches and struggling with um, all the issues that you struggle with, you wonder where it's going. And so this is all leading somewhere. And do not be afraid to take the next step. Do not be afraid to step out into the unknown because many times you really want to know what's going to happen. So if I go off and do this, so what will happen? I just sort of say, you know what? Just step out, take the first step into that unknown and it will lead you into exciting places. And the second thing is failure should not be a deal breaker. Just because it didn't work out doesn't mean that you're never going to be as fabulous as, as you think. It just sets you up to try harder and do better. So that's what I would say. I mean, when I look back, I'm always sort of like, yeah, I would have had less angst about many things had I just said, you know, put myself out there. I love that. And I think uh, even me asking you to go first is testament to your leadership. You immediately went in there after saying, oh, I wish you didn't ask me first. So I'm glad you didn't even hesitate without a beat. You just jumped straight into it. Again, this is leadership and women in STEM. So uh, Shuba, I'll ask you to jump in with your advice for your young self. Ah, what, what can I say? Dorothy has said it all. <laughs> I would tell my young self, it's okay to be different. It's okay to feel you don't fit in. It's okay to to be searching because that's what life is all about. You're searching for answers and the search is actually what's rewarding. Whether you eventually find an answer or not, the search is the process is actually the fun part. So I would tell my young self, you're doing okay. In fact, do more of it. You're struggling to understand or figure so many things out and that's okay. Struggle more, figure out more know that there are others like you who are completely different from you, but when you connect with them, there will be tremendous joy. Know that you may have 
very, very few um, kindred spirits. But when you meet them, they will be worth uh, sort of a hundred sort of popular fans kind of things because those individual relationships are precious. I would tell her, whatever choices you make, make them with a good conscience, as good information as you have, and then trust yourself. Life is really about living the choice you've made. There is no one right answer for anything. It's really about what you make with the right with, with the path you took. So make your choice and jump in there. And it will work out whether you take this road or whether you take that road. You know, if I had a do-over, I don't think I would do anything differently. But heck, I might take a different road just so I see how it works out there. So I'd say go for it. Oh, I love both of these takeaway points. And I think I'm saying this to myself as a listener and also being on the on the podcast is yeah, I'll definitely listen to this podcast again and, and really take notes. So I urge anyone else to, to listen. So I'm just going to quickly summarize uh, where we're at. And I think first and foremost, thank you so much to both of you for coming on the show and being so upfront and really honest about where we go from here. And I, I wish we could have discussed a few more things, but you know, we have season two, so you might get a call back from me. I think to just summarize what uh, these two wonderful guests have said is one, be kind to yourself, especially in this time of COVID. Things are stressful and let's not burn ourselves out just by thinking we can be superheroes. Um, let's take risks in all our decisions. And again, negotiate for your own space, whether it's by your science or space for yourself to recoup and recover from any stresses in life. Always ask questions and don't be afraid to fail. So again, thank you so much for joining us. Could you please share with our listeners where they can find you on social media? I'll start with Shubha. Certainly, my Twitter handle is at Shubha Tole. That's my full name, S-H-U-B for boy, H-A. T O L E. Twitter is the best place. Awesome. And uh, Dorothy? My Twitter handle is at D, as in D E E, boring gacha. Awesome. Thank you so much. And for our listeners, thanks again for tuning in. Please follow us on Twitter at mentor underscore podcast. That's mentor underscore podcast. We will let you know when new episodes are released. You can listen to us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and SoundCloud by searching for your digital mentor podcast. You can reach us by email, so please send your comments and questions to inquiries at yourdigimentor.net. That's inquiries at yourdigi, D-I-G-I, mentor.net. As always, information on the episode will be in the description box, including how to connect with our guests and also links to more information and resources. And finally, our goal is for this podcast to be shared as a resource, so please remember to tell people about us. Thanks again and see you in two weeks.